So a few years back, um, when we started this channel, it, it was called the, the Gun Expert channel. The, the idea was, and the premise was back then, is we were kind of just making fun of the people that were kind of coming up back then, the people that would do reviews, and essentially make themselves feel like they were some sort of expert about the, the gun stuff. This is YouTube when it was pretty new. I think it was only a couple years old at, at that point. And that was the name, Gun Expert, G-U-N-X-P-R-T. And we did a lot of funny shit, and we did a lot of funny videos and parodies and, and all that stuff. There was characters, and in fact, that's kind of where, where our original logo comes from. And now I want to do a video about what it actually takes to be an expert. So it's not a full circle moment. I don't even think it's ironic or, or uh, a coincidence. It's just I, I think it deserves some attention on what it takes to be a, an expert. And in, in what we teach, in the methodology that, that we teach and that we follow, it, there's the warrior expert theory. Uh, is what we talk about. And that is simply through frequent and realistically training, the more likely that you will be to be able to use the power of recognition to better re to respond efficiently during a dynamic critical incident. So again, the more frequent, realistically you train, the more likely it will be that you use the power of recognition to respond more efficiently during a dynamic critical incident. And it essentially is recognition is the way of, of the expert. Now, I, I do a lot of science stuff and I, I love physics. I, I, I love science just in general. This is something that, that I've always enjoyed since, since I was a, a kid. Um, I, I grew up in, in the hood, I guess you could say. I grew up in, in your very stereotypical uh, Mexican neighborhood here in the U.S. anyways. Um, never got involved with with uh, the gang activity, but it was around me, cousins, brothers, um, in gang life. I, I just liked uh, science. That, that's really what I liked. Um, I think one of the very few humans that truly understands it about me is probably my wife. Ever since we, we met, Einstein has been somebody who, who I kind of admired and, and looked up to, just somebody who I like better than you, and I'll fight you on that shit. And the the fascination with this subject uh, although it has nothing to do with with physics it has everything to do with science overall and how we we respond to things and how the limbic system works and, and our motivations internally and and our sympathetic movements and just how it all works and, and the science behind it uh, how it all works i, I stumbled upon a, a video uh, it's called uh the four things that it takes to to be an expert and this is a video by Veritasium, uh, whom it, he's probably one of the, the very few humans who I follow on, on the internet. I, I don't follow much stuff online, uh, but he's very one of the very, very few humans that I actually follow. Uh, one, of, one of the reasons is he's consistently correct, consistently proven to be correct. And his dedication to being correct is one of the things that I, I truly admire. It's not just bullshit. And one of the, the things that he talks about in the video is the four things that it takes. Um, and th those four things are a valid environment, um, many repetitions, timely feedback, and deliberate practice and deliberate practice. And the valid environment, I, I think that's one of the ones where it's very difficult for us as instructors to provide for our students. Now, it is my responsibility as an instructor to provide you with the opportunities to, to be better for training opportunities. Um, so you as a student and me as an instructor, we, we are often conflicted with, with what we teach because it's a range. It's, it's kind of fake. Like we, we have to admit that it's fake. Even when you do sim, uh, simulated stuff, most of the times that's fucking fake. In fact, it, it adds to the level of fakeness when you do simulated stuff. Uh, we, we've talked about that in other videos. So with this, I, I kind of want to make sure that you guys are, are understanding the, this whole idea of valid environment. The idea of the, the valid environment is that we don't, we, the problem is with the valid environment is that we don't really get to predict 
what's going to happen to us. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to us. I don't know how many times I need to shoot. I don't know how fast I need to shoot. Uh, do I need to take one shot? Do I need to take a, a chest shot? Am I going to shoot multiple times at the chest? Am I going to shoot once at the head? Uh, I don't I don't know what the circumstances are going to be. And I think that's where a lot of instructors end up with those ideas that, well, I need something to measure, so I'm going to use a timer and, and get them to a sub one second draw. And um, timers are are fake. It, it's it's a fake thing. It, it's it's not a real thing. I don't know how fast I need to uh, unholster my gun. Uh, it may be pretty quick. It may not be, but processing information is, is more important than that. We have videos where we talk about that as well. Um, a lot of people will set up different targets and do drills like El President El Presidente drill and choreograph how they're shooting, where they're shooting, how many times I shoot this one. But again, I don't know where I'm shooting and how I'm shooting. And if you tell yourself this is the way you're shooting, is it really a valid environment? Uh, we get a lot of students who say, oh, I go to the range frequently. And what that usually looks like is you set up a target, you load ammunition into your gun, and you extend out, and then you pew, 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 pew. And then that's it. But there was nothing valid about that. There was no processing information. The most valid thing that you can do at the range that is going to be consistent with the real fight is processing information. That's that's probably the, the very one thing that is going to happen is you're going to process information. Your body's going to go through some natural reactions and you must respond to that. Your, your gun may malfunction. You should practice how to not look at your gun. And when something happens with your gun, you be able to uh, accept that stimulus um, uh, and, and respond to that stimulus. So acknowledge the stimulus and then respond to that stimulus, right? Like if, you, if your gun's supposed to shoot, but it doesn't shoot, um, your response to that should be receipt magazine, chamber another round. I don't need to look at that in order to do it. Uh, that's valid, right? Because you don't control when that happens. And if it happens, the last thing you want to be doing is looking at your fucking gun, diagnosing it while people are shooting at you or stabbing at you. You should have your eyes on that and your hands can do all this stuff. It's called proprioception. Um, you do it all the time. I'm at a computer right now. I, I have a keyboard and a mouse. I don't need to look at that stuff. So I, I think that's a, a big problem with with uh, training is too many people want to predict what's going to happen, and they do drills based off of that that prediction. And one of the the, the problems with that is you are taking an isolated situation and, and trying to make that the rule, and and, and that's that's a problem. Um, I've got a, a a few clips that I want to play from from that video. Um, that I think is fascinating from it. One of them is this one right here. I'm, I'm just going to play it and, and kind of let it roll. Um, this is the idea of recognition overall. And then after that, I, I, I want to kind of play the video where, we, where he talks about one-offs and shit like that. The five-time world chess champion. He's being shown chess boards and asked to identify the game in which they occurred. Uh, this looks an awful lot like uh, Tal Botvinnik. Fourth game from Seville, obviously. <laughs> now I'm going to play through. And he says, obviously. Uh, hopefully the, the audio is coming through. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that it is coming through. But the idea here is they're showing him games. They're setting up the game pieces and showing him games. And he's identifying who played the games. And it's, he, 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 rem he recognizes the game so much that he an opening and stop me when you recognize the game and if you can tell me who was playing black in this one okay, sure. okay. So i'm sure you've seen this opening before okay it's gonna be on <laughs> so he has a few moves and he's able to tell who who it is um later on they talk about an experiment that that was done that was conducted i think this is a, a good thing to to watch as well um, just to give you also the idea of the the recognition, but once everything scrambled, uh, like in real life, everything is just random. It's really hard for us to perform if we've trained our brain to be a certain way. Chess masters are not exceptional on any of these measures. 
But one experiment showed how their performance was vastly superior to amateurs. In 1973, William Chase and Herbert Simon recruited three chess players, a master, an A player, who's an advanced amateur, and a beginner. A chessboard was set up with around 25 pieces positioned as they might be during a game, and each player was allowed to look at the board for five seconds. Then they were asked to replicate the setup from memory on a second board in front of them. The players could take as many five-second peaks as they needed to get their board to match. From just the first look, the master could recall the positions of 16 pieces, the A player could recall 8, and the beginner only 4. The master only needed half the number of peaks as the A player to get their board perfect. But then the researchers arranged the board with pieces in random positions that would never arise in a real game, and now the chess master performed no better than the beginner. After the first look, all players, regardless of rank, could remember the location of only three pieces. And and we we see this we see this. Uh, I did a video, and it was uh, about Adam Savage, the MythBusters guy, Olympic swimmer. He uh, he brought in an Olympic swimmer to do a myth. The question was: Is there a myth that you couldn't perform the way you wanted to perform because of security reasons, insurance purposes, whatever it was? And this was the the myth that he brought up. He said we we were swimming in two different substances liquid substances one then more syrup like and then the other one water which is regular h2o brought in the olympic swimmer seemed like an obvious choice because the olympic swimmer well he's a fucking gold medalist and, and he he knows how to swim he's gonna give us good times is what they thought and they they brought in the the olympic swimmer and they put him in the in the syrup and go figure he was all over the place, uh, very inconsistent timings. And when they were like, what the fuck? Uh, he's, he mentioned, well, my pool has a black line that I follow. Also, the, the, the water is 90 degrees when, when I jump into my water. This is fucking hot garbage. I'm not used to this stuff. And it, it kind of shows that experiment too, right? Like that in, in that um, experiment, the... The chess player, the the expert, sucks when it's all randomized and it's stuff that they can't recognize, and that's the fear when people set up choreographed targets. When it's like El Presidente drill, that's the only one that I know because I don't follow that dumb shit. Uh, you you shoot twice here and then three here and then four here and then two over here, and but that's not the way it may happen in real life. And that's if if in real life it just random as fuck. Um, you may not be able to perform the way you think you're going to perform because you can't recognize that stuff. So again, I go back to um, the most valid thing that we can do is have a stimulus and a response to that stimulus, the, the stimulus of reload, the stimulus of a malfunction, and then you're responding to that. Um, processing information, that, that type of stuff is significantly more valid than how fucking quick you can unholster your gun because it's too random it's too random there, there's been plenty of circumstances where people hear gunshots they look around but there's nobody there if you're too quick to draw the gun or it's inappropriate time to, to draw the gun uh, you may lose or you may look like the bad guy so there, there's too many things that are random for you to try and choreograph in, in a self-defense situation um the the other problem that we see is, is people with with one-offs Elijah Dickens was a perfect example of this, right? Um, he he was in a situation where he he shot at a person at, at forty yards, they said, and then forty feet, and it was just information all over the place. Isaac has a really good article on that on our website. You guys can look it up. And then everybody was doing the Dickens drill. Uh, everybody was doing it based off of a one-off. So now you take an isolated situation and you try and make it the rule. And that's fuck you. That, that's absolutely fuck you. So a valid environment is super important. Very quick here. I hope that you guys can hear this. Peacefully, would Quebec secede from Canada? And would the dot-com bubble burst? In each case, the pundits rated the probability of several possible outcomes. And by the end of the study, Tetlock had quantified 82,361 predictions. So how do they do? Pretty terribly. These experts, most of whom had postgraduate degrees, performed worse than if they had just assigned equal probabilities to all the outcomes. 
In other words, people who spend their time and earn their living studying a particular topic produce poorer predictions than random chance. Even in the areas they knew best, experts were not significantly better than non-specialists. The problem is most of the events they have to predict are one-offs. They haven't had the experience of going through these events or very similar ones many times before. Even presidential elections only happen infrequently and each one in a slightly different So we, we, we see this a lot. People do the timers or they, they want to draw really fast. And then you have instructors who don't understand the, the data and how to, how to interpret the data if they do have data. Um, the range master data is probably some of the best data set that we have flawed, um, like all data set, but it, it still is the best data that we have available to us. And in that you can find that about 80, 86% of the good guy, bad guy fights are at nine to 15 feet. There is no standard in, in time. If, if you look at it, if you look at that, there is no standard, how fast somebody had a draw and, and how fast the, the, the fight ended. And, and the problem is that people want to predict that. Um, again, the, the point of the clips that we just watched was uh, they, they try and predict the one-offs. They don't have enough experience with that information. So again, you're trying to be really fast in, in something that you don't have enough experience with. What we do have experience with as human beings, though, is processing information. When you drive, you process information. When you're at work, even if it became an automated thing at work, you're still processing information. You find a stimulus and then you respond to that stuff. So it's, it's again, infinitely more important to do that. Um, also many repetitions, right? We, we talked about the, the, the valid environment, but also many repetitions, but also many repetitions, not just 10,000 hours. That, 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 that myth has been debunked many, many times before. You guys can go look that shit up. Uh, I encourage you guys to go look that shit up. Mike DeSargo, has a, a really great article on Personal Defense Network about this uh, idea of the uh, perfect practice, the, the myth of, of the perfect practice. And he talks about that 10,000 re repetition bullshit. Because that by itself is not going to get you there. You need that feedback. You need somebody to, to give you some coaching and tell you what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. If you just go to the range and you just do it 10,000 times, it, it's not like fucking um cooper's going to come down and split the heavens or stoner's going to come down and split the heavens and give you all the gun knowledge that you need that like that's not the way it fucking works somebody who's an expert needs to be teaching you this information and if you just go to the range and do it many times all by itself it's just not good enough it's not good enough but at the same time you do need those repetitions so that your brain and, and your muscles can connect and, and the nervous system can do what it, it's supposed to do when shit hits the fan. Um, you just go to your, your automated, your sympathetic limbic system. Um, so yeah, many reps is cool, but timely feedback is also important. Um, the, the timely feedback stuff is is one where a, a, a human can help you process that information so that you're not focusing on the shit that is is irrelevant that that's not important right well, you could do drills when um that are a little bit more cognitive have a little bit more cognitive load to it um there was a a study that was done and i'll bring this up it's in this video as well. Fantastic video if you guys want to watch the whole thing. But in, in this, uh, he talks about an experiment. I'm just going to play it. Humans, where there's a red button and a green button that can each light up. 80% of the time, the green button lights up, and 20% of the time, the red button lights up. But randomly. So you can never be sure which button will light. And the task for the subject, either rat or human, is to guess beforehand which button will light up by pressing it. For the rat, if they guess right, they get a bit of food, and if they guess wrong, a mild electric shock. The rat quickly learns to press only the green button and accept the 80% win percentage. Humans, on the other hand, usually press the green button, but once in a while they try to predict when the red light will go on, and as a result, they guess right only 68% of the time. We have a hard time accepting average results, and we see patterns everywhere, including in randomness. So we try to beat the average by predicting the pattern. But when there is no pattern, this is a terrible strategy. 
and and that's that's where we we fuck up as, as people of self defense is we we try and predict what what other bad guys are going to do. Again, we we have some numbers, we 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 have some data. The Tom Givens data is a fantastic example, but we still can't predict exactly what's going to happen. And then what we see a lot of humans. I just had this conversation with the student where he he wanted to carry in the shoulder because he rode motorcycles. And I told him the, the limitations of that stuff. There, there's there's some cons to that. And he said, no, if this happens to me, I'm just going to draw my gun and then just shoot the guy. Well, that that's that's what humans do. He's not the only student that has done this. This is people fight. People to this day in 2024 will argue in and out that the way they're going to be standing when they shoot somebody is with staggered feet or what, what we've known as the, the, the weaver stance. Uh, one foot in front of, uh, uh, beside the other, staggered feet, kind of like a, a martial artist. Uh, but you can't predict that. Uh, like maybe it'll happen that way, but maybe not. Uh, so it, it's silly. It is negligent to a certain degree for you to, to pretend that this is the way it's going to be. You're, you're you, again, that experiment as we as human beings, we're like, ah, instead of accepting the 80%. Uh, success rate we we suck because we're trying to predict shit because we're too proud to to accept that we may fail and, and we try and overcome that um we, we can't predict everything we, we just can't the again the best thing that we can do when we're at the range is learn how to process information respond to to stimulus that we have no control over like malfunctions like reloads um again somebody giving commands and, and commands that that make you think right like commands that that actually make you think about that stuff it's absolutely important for for us to um to be cognitive of, of, of that stuff and and not be too proud to admit that we can't predict everything we just simply cannot predict everything um and this is where again that that timely feedback from a coach from an instructor is is invaluable i know a lot of you guys don't want to take the class and, and because you're not prioritizing a class, but I highly recommend you take a, a live fire class with an instructor, preferably with an instructor from uh, the IDS program, intuitive defensive shooting program, um, and get that timely feedback, somebody who's coaching you and, and making you a better uh, shooter in the sense, a better, a more efficient shooter, I should say, not necessarily a better shooter, uh, but also a, a more efficient shooter. Um, the other one, the deliberate practice is kind of goes with that is we, we get in these funks where we're like, well, I, I go to the range. Uh, I went to one class. I sat in inside of a classroom um, and that's it. But no, like well, you can't get too comfy with, with all of this stuff. And, and for this one, I think I'm just going to go straight for for the clip. Um, pew. This is the beauty of me. I, I don't like to fucking, I absolutely fucking hate um, to organize everything because my brain is, is, uh, is all over the fucking place. And, and when you, when I organize everything, I know for some of you guys, you guys hate it. But when I organize stuff and I have a thought, then my thought takes me somewhere else and it's just- Educational institution or turned down for a job, it feels like an expert has considered your potential and decided that you don't have what it takes to succeed. You know, I was rejected twice from film school and twice from a drama program. So it's comforting to know that the gatekeepers at these institutions aren't great predictors of future success. So if you're in a valid environment and you get repeated experience with the same events, with clear, timely feedback for each attempt, will you definitely become an expert in 10,000 hours or so? The answer, unfortunately, is no, because most of us want to be comfortable. For a lot of tasks in life, we can become competent in a fairly short period of time. Take driving a car, for example. Initially, it's pretty challenging. It takes up all of System 2, but after 50 hours or so, it becomes automatic. System 1 takes over, and you can do it without much conscious thought. That's where him and I probably disagree. It's not automatic. It's automated. Um, you, 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 you programmed your brain to do it, so it's automated. Automatic is... Uh, the lowering of the center of gravity, your hands coming up protectively, that happens automatically with it without your permission. Automated is when you when you set it up and you you train yourself to do it. And when you program a robot, it becomes an automated process, but not an automatic process. It still needs something to start it. So that's what that's where him and I kind of disagree on this, maybe. But 
one of the things that that is interesting is he he talks about how we get to a point where we're uh, competent, and I think this is a big downfall of us. We 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 go to the range and we understand how the gun kind of works, kind of. Most of the students that come into my class who claim and they swear up and down, I've been shooting since I was a little kid, have zero fucking clue how a gun works internally. So you you have experience with it, and you become a little competent with it, like you you know where the trigger's at, and you know how to press the trigger and that type of stuff. But then you become very comfortable in in the Dunning Kruger. Go Google that shit if you don't know what Dunning Kruger is, and then you don't take it further beyond that. You're too afraid to push your limits and you want to be at the edge of your limits. Uh, you have to be. After that, more time spent driving doesn't improve performance. If you wanted to keep improving. You going to the range all the time and doing the same shit over and over and over again does not make you a better self-defense person. It doesn't. Improving, you would have to try driving in challenging situations like new terrain, higher speeds, or in difficult weather. Now, I have played guitar for 25 years, but I'm not an expert because I usually play the same songs. It's easier and more fun, but in order to learn, you have to be practicing at the edge of your ability, pushing beyond your comfort zone. You have to use a lot of concentration and methodically, repeatedly attempt things you aren't good at. You can practice everything exactly as it is and exactly as it's written, um, but at just such a speed that you have to think about and, and know exactly where you are and what your fingers are doing and what it feels like. This is known as deliberate practice, and in many areas, professionals don't engage in deliberate practice so their performance doesn't improve. In fact, sometimes it declines. If you're experiencing chest pain and you walk into a hospital... And, and we see this with students, right? We see this with, with people who, who claim they've been in the military and um, that's why they know how to shoot and all that shit. But we have to admit them, a great majority of the people in the military, unless you're in a specialized unit, uh, you guys kind of just qualify once or twice a year, if that. And um, it's all the same same task over and over and over again. So you believe that you know how the fuck to shoot, but it's, it's, it's not beyond your limits. You got competent in, in one area and one doing one single thing, but you don't take it beyond that. You, so there's people that go to the range and they do it frequently and consistently. Yay, awesome, that's hobby shooting. You're not going to the classes. We see this in our classes. People finally show up to our classes after not prioritizing it for a very long time. And uh, in the classes, what we see is people will struggle. You, the people, the amount of humans that struggle moving laterally, just one step, one body width to the side and, and extending their gun out while they're taking that lateral motion and then shooting once they're reaching full extension and they've, they've reached the, the other side, uh, taking that, that full step. So you move and then you shoot. Um, people struggle with that shit. People struggle with accessing the gun um, from their holster and then making that lateral motion. It takes a lot of brain power because they've never done it before. And if they only do it once, it, it's, it's not really enough because they don't have enough repetitions. But then they got too comfy because they did it once. This is where, where instructors who teach drills fail you as a student. Um, they get you to do drills that are fun, but they are drills. They're not teaching you. We don't teach drills. We, te we teach humans. Uh, but there's a lot of instructors out there that they don't know how to teach humans because they don't understand the neuroscience, they don't understand the physics, they don't understand uh, the fighting concepts, they don't understand any of that stuff. So all they have to rely on is timers and choreographed drills. And the drills could be fun, uh, like getting you to, to run from one side to another side and then shooting paper. It, it might be fun to you, but like that, that's, that's easy. It's not really taking you beyond your, your abilities. Um, go find me a video of somebody running from one side of a warehouse all the way to another side of the warehouse and then stopping and then shooting a stationary target that's been there the entire fucking time. Um, but at the range, it, it seems fun, uh, and, but you're never pushed beyond those, those realistic limits. So we, we always caution with, um, when, when you go to the range, 
you take this into account, you, you can get to a point where you become an expert. It's not a bad thing to be an expert, a real expert. Um, you just have to make sure that all of these four are in place, right? You have a valid environment, you get plenty of repetitions with good, timely feedback, and that deliberate practice, you are pushing yourself beyond your, your comfort zone. I, I do want to kind of complete this video uh, just a little bit. Uh thought about those rare diseases in a long time, so they're less able to recognize the symptoms. Only after a refresher course could the doctors accurately diagnose these diseases. And you can see the same effect in chess. The best predictor of skill level is not the number of games or tournaments played, but the number of hours dedicated to serious, solitary study. Players spend thousands of hours alone learning chess theory, studying their own games and those of others and they play through compositions, which are puzzles designed to help you recognize tactical patterns. In chess, as in other areas, it can be challenging to force yourself to practice deliberately. And this is why coaches and teachers are so valuable. They can recognize your weaknesses and assign tasks to address them. To become an expert, you have to practice for thousands of hours in the uncomfortable zone, attempting the things you can't do quite yet. True expertise is amazing to watch. To me, it looks like magic but it isn't. At its core, expertise is recognition. And recognition comes from the incredible amount of highly structured information stored in long-term memory. To build that memory requires four things, a valid environment, many repetitions, timely feedback, and thousands of hours of deliberate practice. And that's where we hope that you, you guys get to. Right? We, we hope that you get to this point where you are, are meeting those four criteria. Uh, one thing where, where it's difficult for uh, humans that, that shoot guns is the alone thing, right? Like if you start off alone, nobody's giving you any information. One of the things that was valuable in the last clip that we watched is the importance of having a coach um, give you that feedback, uh, tell you what your weaknesses are, telling you where you're fucking up. You got to remember an instructor is is meant to push you beyond your limits, make you better. And the only way they can make you better is by telling you the shit that you're doing wrong, not by telling you the shit you're doing right. Um, the shit that you're doing right, that, that we don't need to address that because you're doing it right. We're wasting time telling you the good shit when we need to be spending time finding out the bad shit. So I... I hope that in my, my rambling, all of this kind of makes sense. And, and um, hopefully people that are part of the IDS program uh, maybe takes this video and makes it better. Um, comment stuff below that, that is better or needs clarifying with me. Again, with my brain going all over the fucking place, sometimes I say stuff not in, in, the, in the most clear of ways. And this is why I'm showing you guys the, the videos, right? The, the videos and me talking with the videos is so that my brain kind of has a path to go, but also so that you guys can understand exactly what I'm trying to say. Because um, I get my, my shortcomings. I understand I'm pretty self-aware about sometimes me having a, a hard time communicating the ideas and the concepts that I have in my head um, because my brain's fucking all over the place. That motherfucker is, is all over. Um, we'll go watch the other videos that we've got. Go go watch Veritasium, a uh, fantastic YouTube channel. Uh, honestly, one of, of maybe three YouTube channels that uh, that I follow because they, they strive to be correct. Um, and and that's, that's very valuable when you're talking about science and self-defense and, and physics and, and all that shit. And everything with guns is physics and neuroscience. The way we fight and the way we respond is neuroscience. The way the gun works and, and, and works with our body is physics. All of this shit is biomechanics. All of this is, is science, it's physics, it's, it's neuroscience. You cannot ignore that shit. It might be boring. It may not be stuff that you're interested in, but it's, it's stuff that you cannot ignore. Cannot ignore it. So uh, go watch the other videos. Uh, go do your own research. Uh, make sure you're correct about this stuff. Uh, put some stuff down below that, that kind of challenges the information. Now, if you're going to put shit down that, that is just opinion, um, do it, I guess, helps the algorithm. Um, but nobody gives a shit about opinions. We, we want facts. We want actual facts that challenge the information, not just fucking opinions. Uh, opinions, I'm, I'm kind of getting 
too old for for opinions and to pay attention to opinions and and all that shit. We got to go beyond that, right? There's another video that I want to talk about. It's called The Science of Thinking and, and encourage you guys to go check that out. But anyways, I appreciate you guys sticking around with my rambling and this information. Go watch the original video. I'm going to tag it somewhere. I'm going to put it there so you guys can go watch the original video of Veritasium and, and get that information as a whole. Um, but anyways, until next time, peace.